So I'm talking today about uh, Austrian versus neoclassical analytics, and this is actually a, a fairly new addition to the this main lectures of, at the Mises University, that if you looked at earlier um, schedules from the previous years, like in the, uh, when it first started, they didn't have this lecture. I think the reason they added it was a, a lot of what we do in these lectures is try to get you to see what the Austrians do that's different from the mainstream, and, a lot, and so a lot of times we'll say, now, of course, the neoclassicals do this, but we Austrians do this, and so we thought, especially for those of you who aren't um, going on to study graduate level economics, that maybe we should have a lecture devoted to you. Know, what, what do we mean when we use this term neoclassical? So that's what the, the point of this lecture is, and what, what my goal here in this one is to just lay out almost neutrally, if you will, the, the differences so that in theory, if there were a neoclassical economist that were here, like, you know, bound and gagged perhaps, sitting here watching, <laughs> that you know, he, he'd, he'd, he'd say, oh, okay, yeah, that, that is what we do. You know, so obviously I'm going to be thinking the Austrian way is superior on these, on these different uh, issues I'm going to go over, but I, I hope that a, a neoclassical economist would agree that, that that is a difference and that's, that's uh, what, what they do and what the Austrians do. So before you can even start talking about the differences between the two, you should say, well, what do we mean by a neoclassical? And there I'd like to give you a nice crisp definition, but I can't because... In different contexts, it means different things. So generally speaking, here this week at Mises University, if we're talking about, now we Austrians do such and such, but the neoclassicals instead do this, we basically just mean the other, you know, the mainstream of the economics profession. That if you went to a top 20 school somewhere and, and study graduate economics, like this is the type of economics you would learn. That's basically what we mean. Um, and so at, at that level of generality, a lot of times when we say this is what the neoclassicals do, we, we aren't, we aren't really distinguishing between, you know, there's post-Keynesians, new Keynesians, Chicago school economists, right? So those are all mainstream economists. So the word mainstream is probably, uh, would be a better description if we meet it in terms of that broad of a category. So sometimes this week we'll say neoclassical and mean that interchangeably with the term mainstream, even though um, there are mainstream economists that wouldn't call themselves neoclassicals. In their mind, that's a, a term reserved for a smaller group of people that they hate too. All right, so um, on, on the other hand, um, you know, there's, there's, so there's, in that respect, neoclassical could be a very small group of, of currently practicing economists, the ones that are, and again, I'm going to go over this more carefully in a minute here, but just to give you the flavor of it, the ones who, you know, assume agents are perfectly rational, that they know the future with certainty, or at least they know the probability distributions of everything with certainty, markets clear, uh, you know, the efficient markets hypothesis, all these things are, um, markets are all complete, that there's, you can have contracts for just about anything or any commodity at any future time in any state of the universe, you know, I mean, really hyper-rational stuff, sort of like if you're going to take the approach to modeling formally with mathematical symbols seriously, and you're going to assume that these agents know how to do calculus, you might as well assume that they really know how to do calculus, right? That's the idea that why go halfway with these assumptions? Let's see what this approach yields you. And it, it you know, it is a very elegant body of results, but it's, you know, completely divorced from the actual market economy. And, and most economists know that. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute, but it's, you know, a trade-off that, well, we can't go halfway with the math. If we're going to do it this way, let's really do it. So that's the idea. So a lot of economists recognize that that's wrong. And so you'll see now that there's plenty of mainstream economists at big universities, even Nobel Prize winners, who would themselves ridicule the strict neoclassical economists who assume people are always rational and you know stuff like that. So the behaviorists and um, psychologists and others that are coming into economics are drawing on insights from those fields into economics. They also wouldn't like the neoclassical. On the other hand, um, if you go to a website of the history of economic thought. So the New School in New York has a a nice online uh, compendium of history of economic thought articles, and they're coming from the left typically. But anyway, you know, they'll, they, if you need to go somewhere and you want to get information that's a little bit more detailed than than Wikipedia, if you go there, you can see some things. But they define uh, neoclassical so broadly that even the Austrians would be neoclassicals. Because so in one sense. What neoclassical means is, you know, new classical, meaning what happened after the classical insights. Or, or so, so it's, it's after the, the, the classical economists, but yet it retains the wisdom of the classical economists. Right? So even though we don't like 
their value theory, and, and Joe Salerno went over this in his first lecture with you guys, talking about the, the flaws with the classical approach to um, price theory. And in fact, Karl Marx's economics actually was an offshoot of Adam Smith's economics. Right? A lot of people think that the two are you know, opposite, you know, totally opposed to each other, but they're actually not. I'm not saying Adam Smith was a Marxist. I'm saying Marx's positive description of how market prices work was based on a labor theory of value that he got from the British classical economists. Okay, Marx didn't invent that. Um, so even though that they are flawed in that respect, clearly, what does Adam Smith mean to the common man? He means the invisible hand that markets generally work capitalism as a good system, right? And so, and, and Keynes thought he was reacting against the classical economists. Now, in the general theory, Keynes, I think, puts up a caricature of what economists like Adam Smith and J.B. say said about markets, but nonetheless, Keynes thought he was reacting against them, and it was true that the classical economists basically were free market guys, and they thought that tariffs and other interventions just screw things up. And they also thought that in a depression, it's not because people need to spend more. That's not the problem in a depression, or it's not a dearth of money that causes a business downturn. Right? So the classical economists knew those things. It's just their theoretical framework wasn't very useful, and that's why the marginalist subjectivist revolution came along. Okay, so in that sense, an economist like Alfred Marshall, he would consider himself to be just continuing in the tradition of the classical economists. He thought he was just marrying the wisdom of the classicals with the insights of this new subjectivist marginal approach to price theory. All right, so that in that sense, the Austrians are neoclassicals too. So anyway, but for the purpose of this lecture, obviously, I'm going to be meaning a narrower concept and, and as I go through this, I think you'll, you know, you'll, you'll know the neoclassical when you see him, even though it's hard to come up with a, a, a proper definition. Okay, so let me run through these. I'm going to have um, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different categories so you can pace yourself as to ways in which the Austrians are different from the neoclassicals. Okay, so... First, we got a nice cautionary quote there saying, Every school of thought is like a man who has talked to himself for a hundred years and is delighted with his own mind, however stupid it may be. <laughs> All right, so just keep that in mind. All right, so the first area of difference is the, the subject area of, of methodology. And the Austrians, of course, use the method of praxeology, and the neoclassicals use the method of positivism. Uh, I, I go over this every time, but this is, let me very briefly say it while I have your attention. The, the words method and methodology are not the same word. They're different words. They mean different things. Uh, usually in a paper in the beginning, especially if you're in a formal class, you know, like a, a graduate level economics program, if you're writing an academic paper and you want to explain this is the technique I use to get my results, like I, you know, ran an econometrics star regression or I did this or I, uh, did a, a linear programming example, whatever you're, you're talking about, this is the method I used. A lot of people say this is the methodology, but that doesn't really work. All right, so methodology is a, if a paper is about methodology, that means in the paper, the topic is let's discuss the method we should use in economics. All right, so if you're writing a paper on praxeology, that's a methodological paper. But if you're just saying I used a regression, come up with these results, you're talking about this is the method I used. Okay, uh, so the Austrians, use praxeology. You had a whole lecture on this already, but let me just put it in different words. Uh, so, of course, the Austrians think that economic laws are necessarily true, so long as you did the deduction process correctly, that it's not that you could go out and see a counterexample to an eco economic law. And the analogies we always use are with geometry. That's the one that really clicks with people that, you know, I can show you the Pythagorean theorem. I can prove it. And if you think it's wrong, the point is not for you to go out and start measuring triangles. The point is for you to look at the steps in my proof and say, wait a minute, you went from step three to step four and you said this, but I don't think that's justified. Right? You know, step four, result four, line four in your proof does not follow from line three. That's the way you would attack me. You wouldn't go out and try to measure triangles. All right? Um, because if the proof is true, you know there don't exist triangles that violate the proof, right? Because that's, that's how proofs work. Um, so in the same same way, if you know, as Austrians, if we say uh, other things equal, if the price of a good goes down and the quantity demanded goes up, you don't need to go out and start looking at statistics of prices and quantities 
Because first of all, the way we get out of that is the phrase, other things equal. And the point is, once you know what those terms mean and you think through the logical implications, that result, the law of demand, has to be true. Now, it might not be useful. We can spin out all sorts of tautologies that might be totally irrelevant, but the point is, it's not that you are going to test them the way, in contrast, in the natural sciences, the physical sciences, you do have to go out and do experiments. All right, that, and specifically, the reason for that difference, if you want to get a little philosophical, is in the natural, in the physical sciences, it's true you might have something like a proof that you have a theory, like you said, this is how subatomic particles behave, and we've got Heisenberg's uncertainty principle and all those other things, and you can come up with calculations. And in a sense, the results follow from the assumptions you made, but the point is those assumptions, we don't know if they're true or not, because we don't have any a priori knowledge of what behavior governed or how uh, the behavior of subatomic particles is governed, right? Whereas we do think we know about human action just by introspection and other uh, techniques, right? That we don't have to go out and, and measure it the way we have to test things in the natural sciences. Okay, so that's the way Austrians approach economics. And they, again, the idea is in order for you to just look out at the world and start making sense of it to impose some a, a framework on it, you need to have an antecedent theory. All right? A lot of times people will say, well, you know, you economists are biased. You should just look at, look at the world and see what happened. Let the, the facts speak for themselves. So, you know, looking at the Great Depression, you know, Murphy, you and a guy like Tom Woods, you go in already knowing that it's going to be the government's fault. And that's what you're going to see. Whereas, you know, somebody else, and so you should really just look with, with an open mind. In fact, somebody recently criticized a reviewed Tom Woods' book Meltdown, I think, and used that exact same uh, criticism that Woods went in there with, you know, to do a hatchet job, and he didn't he didn't let the, the facts speak, speak for themselves. But you can't let the facts speak for themselves because there's a, just an infinity of facts, right? That looking back at the 1930s, I might say, oh well, gee, well let's look at carbon dioxide emissions and see what that if that caused the Great Depression, right? <laughs> I mean, because we know it causes global warming, so maybe it causes depressions too. <laughs> right? So the point is, it's, you need to know what facts to even focus on to come up with your theoretical explanation of what happened and what the cause was. And so, um, it, it really, it's very naive to, to say you, you, you have to come up with the facts and then come up with your theory. Now, obviously, in practice, there's a give and take there that, you know, I'm not going to get into now, I'll go on a tangent here, but, it's true if you had very speculative theories about something that were based on empirical beliefs, and then it turned out those empirical beliefs were wrong, you might have to revise your opinion, but the point is that explanation in your mind would not be a pure praxeological theorem, right? It would be more, you know, to say what caused the Great Depression. We know the business cycle theory, the theory is correct. The issue would just be, well, maybe that wasn't the main driver of what was going on in the 20s and 30s. So it is possible that Rothbard and I are wrong when we say the Fed caused the 29 stock market crash. That's that's theoretically possible, but the point would be that would blow up the Austrian business cycle theory. All that would mean is, oh, we mistakenly thought those conditions were what caused what we know happened, and actually it was something else. Right? So it's a a subtle interplay there when you're an economist armed with a priori theories, and then you're looking out at his, the historical facts to try to sift through and come up with an understanding of you know what happened in this time period. All right, so what do the neoclassicals do? And here, it's ironic because they actually, there's a difference between what they do and what they say they're doing. All right, if you will, there's a difference between their method and their methodology that the neoclassicals will tell you, and this was enshrined in Milton Friedman's famous essay. I think he had a book called Essays on Positivist Economics or something like that. Um, and Roderick Long later in the week will talk about it. But what uh, what they say they're doing is that they think they're being very scientific and they think that they're, you know, we know that physics works. That's the, the the queen of the sciences. And so every one who wants to call himself a scientist wants to be like the physicists. Not so much now, I think, as like in the 40s and 50s, like the physicists were. I mean, they they built the atom bomb, you know. And it's like, you know, wow, we can't kill millions of people. These guys are cool, all right? So, um, well, actually, the Keynesians could, but all right. So the uh, so anyway, they, they want to ape the methods of the physicists, and so when they write up methodological pieces, they they think that's what they're doing, and they say, you know, we 
the way Friedman in particular defends himself against the charge that you guys assume people are perfectly rational, that they're supercomputers, and all these other things, or that they, or they know their own preferences, they know what's best for them. You economists assume all these things when you spin your fairy tales about the wonders of the free market. And so the way he dealt with that, Friedman said, yes, you're right, we do make unrealistic assumptions. We assume things that aren't true. And so in that respect, the implications of our model are wrong. But we think that this, the simplifications we're making are innocent enough or small enough so that the results being generated, the predictions getting spit out of this model that we have, are the best we have to go with, right? And that you, it's incumbent upon you, the critic, to come up with a better model that gives better predictions than my admittedly flawed model. That's what, that's what Friedman's, uh, explanation was. And he used an analogy if, of a guy playing pool, like a, a you know, pool hustler, a person who's really an expert, can make all kinds of crazy trick shots. And he says, now this guy might have grown up in the pool halls his whole life, and he's never gone to school and received a formal education. And yet, if we're looking at the, the state of the, the pool table with the position of all the balls, and then he's about to hit the, the cue ball, um, how do we predict what's going to happen? He said, if we are armed with Newtonian physics, we would assume that. We would assume that the, the professional pool player knows those two, and that he's going to apply just the right force so that the mass times the acceleration, blah, 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 and, and does the right thing, all right? And so, and Friedman says, so somebody could point out, well, this guy can't possibly know Newton's laws because he never, you know, formally studied. He's just been uh, a hustler his whole life. And the point is, well, it's a reasonable enough assumption. It's as if he understands Newton's laws because we really can't get in and model all the neurochemical things going on in his nervous system. We don't know. That's an impossible task. At least right now it's impossible. We can take a shortcut and assume that he knows Newton's laws and just use that. And yeah, once in a while we'll be off, but the guy's an expert and so it, most of the time will be close enough. And then he'll say, again, if you want to try to go the route of modeling his nervous system, go ahead, but there's no way you're going to be able to, you know, even if you knew at the molecular level how his cells interact with each other, it's just such a complicated system to predict his actual movements that that's crazy. You're going to get nowhere with that approach. You know, go with our approach, and that's a good shortcut. And so, But the, the criterion for is it, a harmless simplification or is it giving us a really misleading answer is always predictability. That if it gives you better predictions than another model, then it's a better model. That's what it means to be a better model. All right, so that's what Friedman says they're doing, but in practice, a lot of times they don't do that. And Walter Block always gives his favorite example of uh, when, you know, I think he was doing graduate work and he can't, I don't remember what the exact thing was. And he'll probably go over in his lectures with you this week. But when he comes up with, Something that, you know, he came up with an econometric study, a result that contradicted the, the implications about rent control or something like that. I remember what it was. And he showed it to his advisor who had, and, and the advisor just said, you, you got the wrong answer. Do it again. Right? So it wasn't that the advisor said, oh my gosh, maybe we're wrong to think that rent control causes shortages or whatever the issue was. But no, he, he knew that Walter Block had run the regression incorrectly. Right? Or, um, more recently, these guys came out with a study showing that minimum wage laws, when you hike the minimum wage, it doesn't retard employment in fast food industry, in the fast food industry. And most economists didn't even need to look at the study. They just said, that can't be right. That's crazy. All right? So you can see that in practice, even the mainstream neoclassicals, a lot of the, especially the free market ones, they do believe in economic law and they, you know, they, they really, it would take a lot to make them overturn their convictions on something. Okay, so I should move along now. All right, the next one I want to talk about, I don't really know a cute title for this category, so I'm just going to call it explanation. There's going to be three of these in total. So I'm just meaning when they try to explain economic phenomena, these, these are differences between the two schools. So the Austrians believe in cause and effect or they stress the idea of cause and effect. And to some of you, that might sound funny, like, you mean the other guys don't? And no, they don't. Uh, thanks for asking. Um, what, 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 now, I don't know, because with a lot of these mainstream guys, it's, it's hard to know what do you actually think about the economy and what do you have to say, you know, at your job. And I don't mean that they're lying, but I just mean they're, you know, they're constrained, um, and, I don't think a lot of them actually deep down really believe in their models. It's more of, again, Friedman's idea that, well, this is what we have to use. This is the professional standard. This has been vetted through the peer review process, and this is what we all use. And, yeah, there's all kinds of shortcomings. 
But what I mean is, I think some of them know that the models are crazy and that you would never trust the answer getting spit out of them. It's just the way we've set up our institutions. This is the model we're all using right now. Um, like for one, one example, a guy, and this could be apocryphal for all I know, but the story goes that there's a mainstream professor at a big university. Let's, I'm making this up, but let's say it's Harvard and he gets an offer from, you know, MIT and he's deciding whether to stay or go, you know, the money's different, but there's different hours and the commute's different and so on. And he's trying to weigh the decisions and he asks his buddy, what do you think I should do? And the guy says, well, why don't you just, you know, write out your utility function and take the derivative and, and set it to zero? And, <laughs> And, and the guy said, come on, this is serious, right? <laughs> so, so again, I wasn't, so I wasn't in the room with the guys, so I don't, you know, I don't know if that really did happen, but that's the story. But that really does capture the idea here that I don't, I don't think these people actually believe it. Just like when people say, oh man, that Barney Frank, I can't believe how stupid he is. They say, no, he's got a lot more money and power than you do. He's not stupid. He's just lying, right? So, um, <laughs> The same way, I think a lot of these mainstream guys, I'm not saying they're liars, I'm just saying I don't think they actually put as much faith in these models, and so don't, don't get too carried away when you get mad at them, just think, you know, you have to understand the uh, constraints they're under, they have to get tenure and so on. Okay, so, so the Austrians, what do I mean? I'll be really quick on the Austrian stuff, and I'll spend more time on the mainstream guys or the neoclassicals, excuse me. Um, the Austrian cause and effect, what I mean is something simple like, they say, okay, what is the cause of the price of steak? That question is meaningful to an Austrian. The Austrians say, oh, it's ultimately due to subjective marginal utility. The reason the price of steak is what it is is because people have their valuations. And uh, I think, was it Jeff Herbner or maybe it was in Sol Salerno's lecture where they went over the, the marginal pricing and how that, how that works in a state of barter. And you can come up with what the equilibrium price would have to be given everyone's valuations, right? So you can, the Austrian, when they say, you know, what is it that's causing market prices, the Austrian has an answer. Whereas the mainstream economists, that question actually doesn't make much sense. And to give you an example, well, let me tell you what, what their general view is. They think it's simultaneous determination, meaning that what you do is you figure out all the different conditions operating at any given time in the economy. So the you know, consumer preference rankings or utility functions, if that's the way the model's set up, uh, supplies of various commodities, technological recipes that the entrepreneurs know, um, and then you just start writing out conditions that have to be true in equilibrium, and then you come up with you know the equilibrium outcome, and that's what it is. And so it doesn't make sense to say what caused this because it's everything that caused it. So the analogy that um, they they might use is to say in a bowl of marble, if you have a bowl of marbles, if you point to one of them and say what's determining the position of that marble. That's kind of a nonsense question. All the marbles together, like once it's sitting there, are all mutually influencing each other. And the reason any one marble is where it is is because of all the other marbles. And you couldn't really look at a, a you know, a flow of cause and effect. Um, to give a different example, I was in, uh, I, I gave a talk at the Austrian Colloquium at NYU on interest theory, talking about the pure time preference theory of interest. And I was, you know, saying, you know, is it caused by subjective utility or by productivity? And I was going over that, and the a neoclassical guy who was trained at Chicago, who was, you know, a very open-minded guy, and he came and sat in on the lecture because he wanted to see what, you know, what do you Austrian guys do. And then afterward, I was talking to him, and he said, I really got to, didn't understand what you guys were talking about. There's, it's, what do you mean, you know, what is interest caused by? It's just, you know, the, the equilibrium outcome. So in his mind, it was, you, you know, you have the production function, you have the capital stock, you take the derivative with respect to K, and that's what the interest rate is, right? So, you know, what do you mean? What's causing it? It's everything, all the different, uh, what they would call exogenous elements of the model determine the endogenous variables. That's the way they would talk. All right, so that's, uh, again, a simple sort of philosophical difference there that the Austrians, their explanation involves the notion of cause and effect, whereas for the mainstream economists or the neoclassical economist, it, it doesn't really. You know, so they can spit something out of the model, but it's not like there's one thing that operates and then causes something else. Okay, the third one is the area of rationality. So the Austrian, for him, the, the term rationality, to say that economic agents are rational, all he means by that is that they're purposive, that they have purposes, so that human action is necessarily rational. And Mises somewhere says something like, the very term rational action is pleonastic. And they say, well, what does pleonastic mean, Ludwig? And you'll look it up, and it, says, it means redundant. right? So he's saying... It, you're not adding anything by saying rational action, that what Mises means by the term action is necessarily rational. It just means there's a means and framework involved. So 
somebody doing uh, a dance, you say, what are you doing? Are you excited? Are you happy? You say, no, I, my crops are thirsty. I need it to rain, so that's why I'm dancing out here. That's not irrational. You know, the, the common man might say, oh, that's crazy. That's irrational. You should learn about meteorology. But from a Misesian perspective, that's entirely rational, that to be rational doesn't mean you have to be right. It just means you know, what you're doing, there's a means and framework, as opposed to pure reflexes or just bodily movements. So if somebody fires a gun and I go like that, it's, it's, it's borderline. It's not clear that I did that because I wanted to avoid a bullet. It's not that I actually went through and thought that through. It could just be a, a reflex or even better if someone comes up and, you know, cuts my arm and blood starts coming out. It's not that, oh, I'm choosing to do that because I had felt unease at holding too much blood in my system, right? <laughs> it's, you know, I'm not con so it, it's movements of my physical body, but it's clearly not an action in the Misesian sense, right? So that's, you know, that, that's an insight a lot of people don't understand because there's a lot of people that don't even see the distinction between bodily movements and human action, right? They don't realize that the same physical thing could be different depending on the subjective intention. Um, to, to give an example that Hayek uh, gave, he said that, you know, to know if something is a weapon, that's not a purely physical characteristic of it. That's not inherent in the object. You have to know what are the subjective intentions of the, the person using it. So, you know, I, I could take this pen and go up to one of you and, and, and so that's a dumb question and hit you in the eye. And that's certainly being used as a weapon. But if you just saw from afar me doing that, you wouldn't know because maybe it's just a freak accident and I, you know, had an itch and I was about to scratch my head and then I tripped and oh, geez, right, you know. <laughs> so you say, okay, I'm not asking him any questions, right? <laughs> so you see, the, the fact that the pen is a weapon has nothing, you, studying the physical characteristics of the pen, that's not going to get you anywhere. You need to know, uh, what my subjective intentions are. Right, so, uh, <clears throat> this, that's what the what the Austrians mean by purposive action, and, and so if someone's if, if action is so to say that agents are rational does not have any implication on how smart they are or how well they're forecasting the future. That has nothing to do with it. They're rational if they're doing something to try to achieve a subjective end or desire. The neoclassicals, their notion of rationality, so they'll say, "Yep, agents are rational." In our model, we're going to assume the agents are rational. And they mean something entirely different from what the Austrians mean. The, what they mean is that they are, um, they mean a couple things. So one thing is they're very good mathematicians. They can solve the model. So they, in a, in a modern model, uh, especially after the, what's called the rational expectations, uh, revolution or innovation ushered in by Robert Lucas primarily, uh, the way a modern, neoclassical model will work is the agents in the model have to understand what the model is like. So you can't put agents in the model and have them think the Fed is following one rule, but really the Fed is secretly doing something else. You can't have that. So there's complete transparency in the uh, neoclassical models. No need for a Fed audit because they all know what's going on. The um, It doesn't mean, though, that they have perfect foresight. So this is a, a subtle thing that a lot of people get tripped up on. It's true that mainstream neoclassical models did used to assume the person at time one knows what the price of cotton is going to be at time 100. And so he forms his plans, and, and that's how you get a certain outcome. They don't assume that anymore. Now what they assume is the agent at time one knows the probability distribution of the price of cotton throughout time, possibly dependent on you know information he, he learns along the way. All right, so... It's a it's a refinement. So they're they are they're trying to deal with the objection that Austrians and others were raising to this perfect foresight um, assumption they made. So they relaxed it, but it's still true that the agent knows the structure of the model. Okay. The uh, so the way I summarize it, I say there's no regrets. So it's it's true that agents can make mistakes. You can get a neoclassical model that has rational expectations built into it, and agents can. Uh, you know, they can buy stock thinking it's going to go up in price when really it goes down. That's, that's fine. But the issue is when the stock price does go down, the people who bought it, they're going to say, yeah, in a sense, I made a mistake, but I did the right thing with what the information I had at the time. So to give you an analogy, for those of you who are familiar with blackjack, you know, let's say you're at the table and you get an 11 and the dealer has a six showing and it's a freshly, you know, shuffled deck. And the correct thing to do is for you to double down. 
Now, it's possible you double down, you get a two, the dealer flips a four, and then pulls a ten, and you lose your money. And you can say, yeah, if I had known that was what the sequence of cards on the top of the deck was, I wouldn't have doubled down. But the point is, you're not really going to be mad at yourself because you know you did the right thing with the information you had at the time of your decision. right? So that's the only sense in which agents can make mistakes in formal neoclassical models with rational expectations. And so in particular, it's it's more difficult to see the role of entrepreneurship and what function profits serve if in your model everybody knows the probability distributions of consumer t taste changes and technology changes and all that stuff. right? It's So you see these assumptions do lead to certain policy conclusions, but in this lecture I'm not going to talk so much about policy, I just want you to see like, the way they, they look at economic analysis and why that sort of filters into their conclusions. Okay, so the next one is utility theory. So here the Austrians have a definitely ordinal approach to utility theory. The neoclassicals, it's subtle, I, I, so I've described it as ordinal in theory but cardinal in practice. Okay, so Again, a brief refresher for the Austrians, just in case somebody lo you lost this in the beginning. So ordinal, what does it mean when we talk about ordinal versus cardinal numbers? An ordinal number, the ordinal numbers are things like first, second, and third, whereas the cardinal numbers are, you know, 1.278 and, and 3 sixteenths and things like that. Okay, those, so that's the difference. Um, you, th you can remember that ordinal it means an, an ordering, okay? Uh, so for the Austrians, utility theory, it, it doesn't make sense to say something like an apple has three times as much utility as an orange. That doesn't make any sense. It's not merely that it's false or that how could you ever know something like that. It's that the statement is nonsense. It's like saying, uh, you know, Joe is 3.7 times a better friend than Mary is, right? That, <laughs> Now, Joe might be a better friend than Mary, and I can, if someone says to me, who's your best friend, I can answer that, and that seems perfectly sensible, but when someone says, you know, how many Joes would it take for you to be willing to give up one Mary, <laughs> you see that that's, that's a little bit odd, and especially if you said, you know, how, much, how many friendship units, you know, would seven Joes have, right? Okay, so, um, so anyway, that's the... That, that's where the Austrians are coming from. And then, of course, there, there are implications of, of all this stuff, but let me just move on. So the mainstream, the, or the neoclassicals in particular, they, so, so be careful. Those of you going on to grad school, when you start arguing with a mainstream economist or a neoclassical economist, you don't want to go in guns blazing and saying, you guys believe in card and utility and that's stupid, because if they're sharp, they're going to say, no, we don't. Go look at any, any micro book, and you'll see that when we derive utility functions, it's actually, that's just a shortcut we're using. We really are only assuming that there are ordinal preference relations. So for the, the purpose of this talk right now, I'm not going to get too technical, but what they, what they do, and so that's true. And um, if you look at, Brian Kaplan has an essay that received a lot of attention called Why I'm Not an Austrian Economist. You could just Google that, Brian with a Y, B-R-Y-A-N, Kaplan, Why I'm Not an Austrian Economist. And he, he was, like, it, when he was in high school, I think he was a huge fan of Mises and Rothbard, and then he sort of uh, w was disillusioned with that. And now I is not doesn't consider himself an Austrian. He's still a fellow traveler. But one of his main objections was that he thought the Austrians were just being goofy by accusing them, the neoclassicals of believing in cardinal utility because they use what certainly looks like cardinal utility functions, right? So what do you mean you guys don't believe in cardinal utility? And well, the the explanation they'll give again is that it doesn't. Um, if they say, you know, the ut u equals two times o plus uh, the square root of a, where o and a stand for the amount of oranges and apples, and so you can plug in how many does the consumer buy and come up with how many utils does he have, the, the neoclassical is going to say, we don't really mean anything by that except to say the, um, you know, if you drew the indifference curves, that we could figure out where you maximize this function u, that's where you're going to be in the highest indifference curve. Right, and so like I said, it's, it'd be a little bit technical for me to get into now, so I don't want to. But um, th that's what they mean, and, and, in, and in particular, they're, they're you know smoking gun as to show they don't really mean anything by utils per se. Is they'll say you can do what's called a linear transformation of a utility function, and it's not going to screw up anything. That you give me a utility function that refers to this consumer, you can then take all the numbers it generates and multiply them by two and add three. 
and that's not going to change anything, right? That when the consumer maximizes and tries to buy different bundles of oranges and apples, depending on their price and his budget constraint, you're always going to get the same optimum bundle popping out, even if you transform the utility function the way I said. All right, so we don't really mean anything by assigning numbers of utils to t particular bundles. It's just a, a shortcut so that we can use calculus rather than doing, you know, graphing it. All right, so that that's what they they say, and, and like I said, that is true. That a, a good micro textbook at the graduate level will go over that and show you, and even stress, don't think that the utils mean anything. It's not that people really have utils. What they have are ordinal rankings of various bundles of goods. But in practice, I think most neoclassicals actually do believe in utils, and I've even seen recently. I mean, there's an argument about. Uh, uh, progressive taxation, you know, taxing richer people at a higher rate, and and other people are arguing about it. And w Will Wilkinson had a thing, and then um, I think Matt Iglesias came back with something, and Alex Tabarrok at GMU commented, and the, and they all were arguing with each other, and they they were all just taking it for granted that there were utils that were interpersonally comparable. And the matter was just, you know, is that the justification for why you have progressive income taxation? And that's what they are. And now, I think Tabarak at GMU probably, he might not believe in utils, but my point is he didn't even get into that because he was arguing on other issues. So the point was it was assumed that people have utils and you can talk about if I take a dollar from a rich man and give it to a poor man, have I increased total social utility? Right. So that kind of talk, I mean, that's far beyond what's going on in the micro textbooks when they talk about you know, just revising or come up with a shortcut, shortcut to predict consumer behavior. All right, so that kind of stuff, coming up with a social welfare function where you add up everybody's utils, that does not follow directly from the little trick they use uh, to come up with cardinal utility functions, right? So it's, like I said, they, if someone's sharp, they'll think that they can answer you, but I think in practice they actually do believe in Benthamite utility that you can add up and come up with social happiness or social utility. Okay, so remember to pace yourself. This is the fifth one. I think we got two more after this. Uh, <clears throat> so again, a different, uh, another difference between them and the way they explain things. So I'm calling this explanation part two. The Austrians ex uh, explain economic outcomes by reference to the choices people make, whereas the neoclassicals rely on indifference. So in terms of the Austrians' choice, be very quick on this. When you say, you know, how is it, why is it that there's a market price is what it is? And the Austrians will say, well, because people, you know, they have preference rankings. And when, you know, why is this thing $5? Because it was worth it for this, for the last person to, you know, they preferred the object to the $5 bill. So they made that chain exchange. But then at that point, we were in the plain state of rest. And given everyone's preferences at that point, there were no reverse valuations. And so no one wanted to, you know, no one strictly preferred the other thing to what he had and vice versa. So that's why there were no more exchanges at that point. Right. So you're always explaining each individual exchange and then the cessation of trading by reference to uh, differences in valuations and people strictly preferring one thing as so they choose to swap it. The mainstream or neoclassical economists, in contrast, and I'm sure many of you have seen this, the way they explain prices is through indifference. So they'll draw an indifference curves, and then they'll the way they'll explain economic behavior is to, ch to show at what point would no action take place. And then that's what they say, oh, that's got to be the resting point. All right, so it's a... Uh, the, they both sort of agree with what the other person is saying, all right, so that the, the neoclassical economists, they understand... That at all the what's called infra marginal trades, there was a strict difference in valuation going on. But their point is, people keep trading until you know breaking up into infinitesimal units. The person's just indifferent, and so the reason they bought 3.87 units of apples at this price per pound is because that was the exact point at which you know using calculus, uh, the person's indifferent between acquiring one more tiny unit of apple or giving up one more tiny amount of money. All right. And, and so that's, again, it's sort of a philosophical difference. Part of what's driving that is the uh, mainstream neoclassical assumptions of perfect divisibility of goods and so on. That if you, if you ask a, a mainstream neoclassical economist, do you actually think in the real world people buy, you know, 
I guess, applesauce, you know, to have apples divided up into so many fine units. And they say, well, no, we know that there's lumpiness, that in the real world, people might have just strict valuations, not ever actually being different. But this is a, you know, a fair assumption. And again, it always, the explanation for a lot of this is it allows us to use calculus. It makes the analysis more tractable, is the word they would use. Okay, so again, be careful. I know a lot of Austrians say, the neoclassicals explain things by indifference, but that makes no sense. If you're going to trade something, you can't be indifferent. And that is true, but like I said, technically what they're doing, they're not explaining all 12 units that are being traded by indifference. What they're saying is they would be indifferent at the 12th unit, and that's why they trade up to that amount. So they would realize if you challenged them, yeah, they must not be indifferent on units 1 through 11.999. But it's true that they don't really think like that. All right. I'm just telling you. Uh, let me let me see here. I just need to skip ahead. Or okay, yeah. I want to do it on this one. I had an anecdote, but I'll save the anecdote for this one right here. Okay. So another difference in the way they explain things is market process versus equilibrium states. So the uh, Austrians, and particularly the Austrians who are centered around George Mason University. They like to stress this a lot in particular. Uh, but you know, Mises has a line somewhere in human action to the effect that the market is a process. So he means so he's saying it's not just a place. It's not like, oh, there's the market over there. He's saying the market is this process that it's people interacting, and it's not just a snapshot in time, it's the whole you know, you need to understand the, the, the equilibrating forces and so on. That to really understand how does the market operate. You can't just take a snapshot and look at the equilibrium prices. You need to know if it started out in a state of disequilibrium, how does the market converge, assuming nothing else changed, on uh, an actual final state of rest and then in an the, the evenly rotating economy if, if everything stayed the same. Right. So that's uh, a huge difference between the way the Austrians and the neoclassicals look at it. And this has implications primarily in antitrust theory, that Understanding the market process the way the Austrians do, or you know, looking at uh, Hayek's essays on the use of knowledge in society and realizing that something can happen across the world, a, a, a copper mine can collapse, and what happens? That pushes up the price of copper, so then industrial users around the world economize on copper. They start substituting and using other metals. If, if they're given their process, they can they have a limited range of substitutability, and so the market price sort of communicates information about, so the people don't need to get a fax from the owner of the coal or the copper mine saying, whoa, whoa, we have less copper than we thought yesterday. You better scale back your operations. You don't need to do that. The market price sort of captures that information. All right. So the, all those types of insights are what the Austrians have in mind when they talk about the market being a process. And you lose almost all of that in the mainstream approach the neoclassical approach, where they just look at equilibrium states. So in their mind, you know, a copper mine collapses. They're not going to worry about how the prices go around and change people's behavior in that interim period. They're just going to say, okay, what's the new situation? What does the new equilibrium price of copper have to be? How much would people buy these various this new price? And they go and, re and resolve the model that way. So uh, like I said, it's... Just looking at those two distinctions there from those approaches, you might say, well, that doesn't seem like such a big deal. But really, in practice, if you want to understand why it is that people who feel one way about antitrust come up with what to the Austrian is just, you know, crazy implications. And Tom DiLorenzo, I think later in the week, is going to talk about that. You, uh, you know, you, a lot of it is, I think, explained by the, by this, uh, focus on equilibrium states. Let me give you an example. When I was in grad school, uh, there was a, a test, and the question was something like, okay, picture a guy on a deserted island, so there's just this guy, he's, there's no one to trade with, and he's got a tree that's yielding coconuts, and, you know, it, and he knows the, the, the function relating time to how many coconuts. So he knows at time one, this many coconuts comes out, time two, this many, and so on. So he knows that function, and then what does the, um, what does the interest rate have to be in this world? What's the, that, that's the question. And so I was like, what, what the heck does that even mean? It's a guy on the island by himself. What would the interest rate even be? You know, who is he going to trade with? 
So then I thought, oh, well, you know, it maybe has to do with time preference. And so I, if you're in grad school, the, the, the beta, you know, that's the discount on future utils. So I said, oh, it's one over beta. And that is, no, that's wrong. Um, so I, I, and it turned out what the answer, what they were looking for was you had to say, suppose there were an intertemporal coconut market, right? Because the only thing, the only good in this island was coconut. So the interest rate, they meant the real interest rate, they meant What's the, you know, if you trade one coconut today for a coconut next period, how many are you going to get? And again, this is a guy by himself, but the way they, that's what they mean when they solve it. They, they're they trying to simplify things by saying, does it have one guy, right? We'll make it easy and get rid of all these other things. And the, <laughs> and the, uh, and I'm, this is true, by the way, I'm not making this example up. The, so the, so the answer, you know, they were looking for is they said, okay, we know the guy can't trade coconuts away. He can't take a present coconut and offer it away to get more in the future, or go the other way. He can't borrow against his future coconut. So maybe if, you know, suppose the the way the the function works, it's like on time one there's one coconut and there's two coconuts and three and four and five. So every period more physical coconuts are shooting out. He might want to borrow against that future income stream. So he might want to, you know, get maybe just like smooth it out. Maybe just you know consume two coconuts a day forever, and he pays for that because he borrows up front, and then later on when he's got more than two shooting out, he's got to pay the interest on his coconut debt, if you will, right? All right, you people are laughing, but this is, this is serious stuff. So <laughs> you can increase your utility if you can trade uh, intertemporally with coconuts. All right, so, all right, but so you see, so that's what, what they meant when they said, what's the interest rate in this world? They meant what's the... Uh, the real ex intertemporal exchange rate of present for future coconuts. And okay, you know, that's, that's what it means. And, and so, but then further, you say, well, how do I solve it? Because it's just a guy, and you say, well, the, what, what it had to be is, you know, using his utility function, knowing how he felt about consuming more coconuts today versus the future, uh, what would the interest rate have to be to make him indifferent between consuming what shoots out of the tree every period versus trying to go into the time market and trade coconuts? Right, because we know the equilibrium outcome has to be that every period coconut shoots out, and that's what he decides to consume. But if we're going to lay on top of that a market where he has the possibility of trading intertemporally, the market price has to be such as to render him, you know, unwilling to go use that market to avail himself of that option. Okay, so that's what was all packed into that question, and that's the way that's the way you solved it. Okay, so you had to again. The reason I'm saying that illustrates the indifference in the equilibrium states is they were saying, you know, that what, do the, what does the equilibrium price have to be so that he's indifferent and he's willing to go along and consume the coconuts that shoot out? Because we know that's what, what, what the answer has to be. Okay, so that's, uh, in fairness to them, it's not as totally crazy as it sounds. They weren't doing that because they thought it was useful to predict consumer behavior on a desert island. It was more the Robinson Crusoe approach that let's teach the principle on this real simple thing so that in a more general model, you know, with machines and so on, that we, we don't lose sight of how you found out what the real interest rate is. But that's, I think, a good illustration. You know, an Austrian, of course, would never reason like, like that. Okay. All right. And then the last difference is their approach to capital structure. Now, I'm, of course, picking the things that to me are, are different. If a, if a different faculty member were up here, he would focus on probably different categories, right? But for me, the difference in capital structure is crucial, and that's really why it's going to sound patronizing, but truly, when I see guys on CNBC arguing about the recession and how do we deal with it, I mean, they don't even understand the Austrian point about the capital structure and how it can become unbalanced the way Roger Garrison showed you yesterday with his PowerPoints, right? That they don't even... It's not, it's not that they get that and then they think, oh, but maybe other things are more important. It's that they're not even acknowledging that possibility of that aspect of the problem and they don't realize that their recommendations to, you know, oh, we gotta stimulate consumption spending and we gotta, the Fed needs to keep interest rates down, uh, to, to make sure we stimulate spending. I mean, they don't see that that's the exact wrong thing to do if part of what the problem is is this imbalance in the capital structure. Alright, so, the, the specific concrete difference is the Austrians, they believe in the Mangarian order, or orders, excuse me, meaning they arrange goods, so you have first order consumer goods, and then you have second order goods, which are 
the goods that are used to produce first order goods and then third order goods and so forth. So you have higher and higher stages of production or orders of goods on the Hayekian triangle. You know, if from your point of view, here's the triangle that starts low and gets big. Here in consumption is the first order. And then as you go higher and higher back, you know, to wholesale and manufacture and mining and so on, that's you're getting into higher and higher stages of production. And so the idea is what determines the height of a particular stage? It's how remote is that activity from the final consumer good that's going to shoot out of the pipeline at the end of the process. And so the, the Austrians are fairly unique. I don't, I don't think any other school thinks of it that way. I mean, the only time you'll see it is in a, in a macro book, a mainstream macro book at the intro level where they talk about when they're doing uh, GDP calculations or GNP calculations and they show how you, you, you only want to add the value added at each stage. You know, they'll say here's the, 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 the wheat farmer and then there's the, 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 the flour and the, the miller and the, the baker and so on and they'll add the value added at each stage. That's really the only time where you'll get a sense of the fact that goods go through a, a sequence of operations and, and that you know, goods in process pass through different hands, different firms touch up things and then pass it on to the next person and that there's a huge chain before raw natural resources get transformed into finished consumer goods. The most mainstream models don't deal with that aspect of things. So when you're trying to understand the business cycle, if the Austrians are right, then obviously that's, that's the whole story is understanding that process and that it's not just a matter of we've got natural resources and we just put them into a production function and the next period outshoots the finished consumption good, right? So that's how the mainstream neoclassicals do it. They have typically in their models, especially a macro model, they'll, it'll be composed of one good and they'll just talk about the capital stock, which they usually represent by a K. All right, so you clearly, you cannot have the Austrian notion of a heterogeneous capital structure where, so to give you an idea, in the Austrian view, it's not enough to just say, well, what's the capital stock right now? Because if we had all tractors and nothing else, we would die. Most of us would die pretty soon, right? <laughs> or if we had all, uh, you know, mainframe computers, we would all die. Or we all, all hammers. If we had a bunch of hammers and no nails, well, that's pointless, right? So you can see it's not just a matter of, do we need more or less capital? It's that you need particular capital goods that complement each other in certain ways, and there's an interlocking structure to it all. And that the people who are doing the mining then pass those, you know, mined materials over to the next stage, and then they process them, refine them, and pass them over to the next stage. And so by the time you're at the point of the guy, you know, running a, a warehouse, and the clerk at Best Buy says, well, we're out of TVs, let's call the warehouse and get some more, I mean, they can't just on a dime do that. There needs to have been processes in motion for years in order for the person at the whole st uh, the warehouse to be able to get more TVs to the people when the consumers you know, take the last one off the shelf. Okay, so that time dimension and the interlocking capital structure you get in the Austrian school, you don't get that at all uh, in the, the mainstream approach. Okay, so that's those were the uh, all the categories I had, let me just in closing say that later in the week, once we start with the, you know, the breakout sessions, I do have a topic where I'm going to be talking about, uh, Austrian solutions to main neoclassical puzzles, something like that. So then that one will, will it'll be more of a, of a, you know, showing the absurdity in it, whereas like in this one, I was trying to just show you the, uh, the broad differences. So I'll uh, stop at that point. Thanks.